Well, God bless you, Calvary family. It's such a joy to be able to share God's word with all of you. I want to thank you for your prayers and your support of our ministry. I want to let you know that we think about you and we pray for each of you. And if there's anything specific we can help you pray for or anything we can help you uh, with, uh, please send us a, an email. My email address is pastornoel420 at gmail.com. You know, the Bible is timeless. If you didn't know it was written thousands of years ago, you would have thought it was written just last week. Its insights are as relevant today as they were the moment they were written, some 1972 years ago. And that's when the first letter to the Thessalonians was written. It's attributed to Paul, who wrote it while he was in the city of Corinth around A.D. 51, just a few months after having preached in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. And upon leaving Thessalonica under duress, Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveled to Athens by way of Berea. But after a short time in Athens, Paul felt the need to receive a report from the newborn church in Thessalonica. So he sends Timothy back to serve and to minister to the new believers there. And in this letter, Paul wanted to check in on the state of the Thessalonians' faith for fear that false teachers might have infiltrated their number. However, Timothy soon returned with a good report, and that's what prompted Paul to pen 1 Thessalonians as a letter of encouragement to the new believers. So why is 1 Thessalonians so important today? Now, everyone would like to have some insight into what the future holds. How much more so when it comes to the end of the whole world? 1 Thessalonians provides Christians with the clearest biblical passage on the coming rapture of believers, an event that will inaugurate the seven-year tribulation. And at the rapture, Christ will return for his people. The dead in Christ shall rise first, while those still living will follow close behind. And all believers will meet Jesus in the air to begin an eternity spent with the Lord. So what is this letter about, this first letter to the Thessalonians? Impressed by their faithfulness, in the face of persecution, Paul wrote to encourage these early believers in that community with the goal that they would continue to grow in godliness. Paul knew that the people had been exposed to errant teaching from those in opposition to the way of Christ and the grace of God. And Paul also understood that unless the young church continued to mature in its faith, the danger would only increase over time. And so with that in mind, Paul taught the people that any spiritual growth would ultimately be motivated by their hope in the ultimate return of Jesus Christ. Paul was never interested in simply telling people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, for he knew that, that ultimately inspired change was a life of consistently walking the power of God's Spirit. And so to a group of young Christians with questions and uncertainties, Paul offered hope of Christ's return providing both comfort in the midst of questions and motivation to godly living. So how do we apply this ancient letter to our lives today? Remember what I said at the outset. The Word of God is timeless. It's as relevant today as it was the moment it was written because it's inspired by God himself. So let me ask you this. Do you ever feel as though your Christian faith has grown stale? That you're withering on the vine when you would rather be flourishing in his service? Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is a perfect remedy for such a feeling because its focus on Christ's return provides water for the thirsty soul today, encouraging growth and maturity by providing hope in the midst of suffering or uncertainty. Paul's specific practical instruction for this process of sanctification can be applied directly to our current circumstances. By clinging to our hope in Christ, we may see several clear results in our lives. Whether it's refusing to defraud others, appreciating those Christians who serve on your behalf, refusing to pay evil for evil, rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and giving thanks in all things. And these are just to name a few. This list, of course, is not exhaustive, but the first letter to the Thessalonians makes clear that every Christian should expect to grow in holiness over the course of his or her life. Towards the end of this letter, Paul writes final instructions. It's known as the final exhortations. 
These are things that he wrote they should endeavor to do to keep the faith and to stay connected to God and to each other as they grow in grace and they grow in the faith. And I want to pick up on three of these final instructions that I believe every Christian today needs to keep in mind and follow in order to continue to thrive in the times we're living in now. Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, God, for this time we'll spend in your word. I thank you for your precious, timeless treasure we call the word of God because it continues to feed us, bless us, guide us, encourage us, admonish us. And I pray you would use today's message to teach us what we must do for the light of Jesus to shine in and through us so that we may continue to boldly proclaim who we believe, who we follow, and that we may be a blessing to those around us. In your precious name we pray, amen. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul gives a series of instructions to these early believers. Things he felt they needed to do to continue to grow in their faith and they continue to advance the kingdom of God and his truth in the face of false teachings and opposition. And I want to pick up on three of them and share those with you today. The first one comes from verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always. It was important for Paul to remind these early believers to rejoice. He knew that they were facing opposition. They were facing the threat of persecution. They knew that false teachers and false teachings had begun to penetrate the early church. And it was important for, for them, yes, to have hope in Christ. And yes, to continue to grow in their knowledge of the word of God. But it was equally important that they remain in joy, in the joy of Christ to experience the fullness of God's joy in their life. So he says, rejoice always. Rejoice in all circumstances. Rejoice in all environments. In other words, don't let the things that happen externally, the unexpected, unforeseen, unplanned, those things that can knock anyone down, don't let those things rob you of your joy. Steal your joy. You know, God... Uh, one of his promises to us is that we would live a life of joy. In fact, joy is one of the attributes of the Spirit, the, the, the gift of the Spirit. It's one of the expressions of that gift that God has given each of his followers. And for that reason, our joy doesn't come from external stimulation or external circumstances. It's something that God puts in our hearts. Paul could say this because he himself found himself in very dire circumstances when he wrote the book of Philippians, for example, which many consider the most joyful book in all the Bible because in it, no less than 40 times, Paul uses the word joy, rejoice, rejoicing. And Paul says this when he writes this letter from a prison cell. He says in Philippians 4, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things in Christ through Christ who strengthens me. And here we find Paul saying that he has learned to be content in all circumstances. You see, contentment and joy are not dependent on circumstances. They're not dependent on conditions. They're dependent on a firm trust in Christ. The knowledge that God has saved you and the knowledge that God will take you and lead you to your eternal home in heaven is enough for us to find and draw from that inner joy that he has placed in our hearts. And that's what enabled Paul to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Friend, one of the best things you and I can be doing in the face of adversity and opposition is to draw on that joy that God has put in our heart. That joy that is an expression of that fruit of the Spirit. To draw on that joy that comes from within because God has put it there. Rejoice always. Always look in every circumstance each day the opportunity to rejoice. The second thing he says in verse 17 is pray without ceasing. This should be automatic. Every believer should recognize the power of prayer. When we pray, we are connecting with God. We are basically communicating with him in communion, in fellowship. Prayer is what connects us to God. It's our lifeline to him, if you will. And Throughout Scripture, we are constantly encouraged and urged to summon the power of prayer. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the same Paul says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In 1 John 5, the apostle says, now this is a confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for. That's the confidence with which the Bible wants us to approach God in prayer. And then in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus himself says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. James 5.16 reinforces that. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, throughout Scripture, the power of prayer is well-registered and well-recorded. And if we only draw on that and we take that lifeline and we put it to work, we put it to use, and we pray with faith, we pray with that expectation, amazing things will happen. Paul knew that prayer was important for this early church in the face of opposition and persecution. He knew that prayer was not only their lifeline of God, but it was also therapeutic for them because he knew that when they prayed, when they summoned God's power and protection, when they went to him in prayer, it would give them that peace and that assurance that only God could provide. And then thirdly, in verse 18, Paul says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, giving thanks in all circumstances comes down to one thing. It's about attitude. We're talking about an attitude of gratitude. It's not just a simple act. It's not in response to something that happens to you. But when he says, give thanks in all circumstances, Paul is describing the attitude of gratitude. A person's attitude is a response to life circumstances. You know, he doesn't say give thanks for everything. He says give thanks in in all circumstances. Because when you really think about it, No matter what happens, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in, if you look closely, you will always find a reason to be grateful. You know, Matthew Henry, the famous Bible expositor of the past generation, was once accosted by thieves and he was robbed of his pocketbook. And this is what he wrote in his diary following this dramatic experience. He said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. That's an illustration of what it means to be grateful in all circumstances. To find reasons to thank God despite your circumstances. And I think all of us, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, can follow the example of Matthew Henry and so many others that have come before us and always have an attitude of gratitude because that attitude of gratitude will help us to recognize God's faithfulness, his blessings, and how much he loves us. 
when you consider his faithfulness and how much he blesses you, you get to understand the enormity of his vast love for you. And so gratitude, in fact, gratitude has been linked scientifically to so many health benefits. The happiest people happen to be the most grateful people according to different studies that have been done over the years. And some of the healthiest people also happen to be some of the happiest people because they're grateful. They're grateful and that gratitude does so much good for us spiritually but also physically. You know, a mother once wrote, that when she was a young mother with two preschoolers, she was often overwhelmed. One night, she fell to bed exhausted. She poured out her frustrations to God. She said, the kids won't mind. The house is a mess. My husband doesn't seem to care. And the list went on. And suddenly, a voice said to her heart, which one do you want me to take away? Everything that she was complaining about was precious to her. And immediately, she began to thank God for everything on that list something that she continues to do now as a grandmother. Now think about that. If you're a mother and you're going through a season in your life where you're burdened by uh, looking after your young children, looking after parents and work, and all of these things are creating pressure for you, recognize that the people behind those cares and those burdens are valuable to you and precious to you. And when you thank God for them, you'll see them and the circumstance in a different light. It reminds me of another story about a man who owned this piece of real estate that was quite large. It was on a large acreage. And the house was beginning to run down and it needed uh, maintenance. It was neglected for years. Um, And this man looked at the pool and he noticed that the, the pool was... The water was not clean and it hadn't been filtered and he looked at the grass and how grass and the weeds were growing and he looked at the house in disrepair and he summoned the real estate agent and he said, hey, I want to to sell this property. Help me to sell it. And so the real estate agent asked this man to describe the property to him over the phone and which he did. A day later, the real estate agent calls this man back and says, I've got the ad, but I want to run run this ad by you before I post it. And the man says, well, read it to me. And so the real estate agent said, nice, large house on an open open, uh, piece of land, secluded and private. And it's nestled in this a uh, nice spawning garden with grass and plants and trees next to an, an Olympic-sized pool with a view of the, va- of the mountains and the hills. And so as this real estate agent read the ad, the owner of the property reflected on exactly what he had. And what, what he discovered is the same things he was complaining about were the things that he most loved. And so he said to this man, you know what, forget it, scrap the ad, because I just realized that that's what I've always wanted. You see, friends, so often, when we don't have an attitude of gratitude, that limits our ability to see what we have. It limits our ability to recognize how much God has been faithful and how much he has blessed us. But an attitude of gratitude gives you that vision, it gives you that lens to recognize that what you have is what God has given you. And if we only take the time to reflect and to thank God and to think about what we have, you'll realize that you're so much, you're so much blessed. You're you're blessed beyond measure. And that will help you to better appreciate not just the things, but the people around you. So I leave you with these words final instructions Paul left the early church with, which, is, which are just as pertinent as they are today. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in all things. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for being so faithful. Help us to rejoice always. Help us to discover and rediscover the power of prayer. 
to summon your power through prayer, to become prayer warriors. And Lord, help us to have an attitude of gratitude, to be thankful in all circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us today. May God continue to richly bless you.